The financial stability outlook in the euro area remains fragile. Higher interest rates and weaker economic prospects are putting pressure on borrowers, especially in real estate markets. Are there reasons to worry? We've just released our latest financial stability review, which twice a year takes stock of the potential risks to financial stability in the euro area. Today, we'll talk about whether the financial system is stable and take a closer look at the emerging risks, especially in property markets. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Stefania Secola. I'm joined by John Fell, who works in our financial stability department and is a regular guest here on the ECB podcast. Nice to have you here again, John. Thank you, Stefania. John, let's start from taking a look at what has changed in the six months since you last talked on our podcast. Back then, financial markets were shaken after bank failures in the US and Switzerland. Today, key interest rates are record levels. This is helping to bring down inflation, which is very welcome development. There are two sides to this coin, though, and some worry about sluggish economic prospects. How are financial markets responding to this environment? Well, first off, financial markets quickly shook off uh, the shock that was triggered by the US and Swiss bank failures that you mentioned. While there were expectations that those stresses might have led to an earlier end uh, to the monetary policy tightening cycle in order to safeguard financial stability, the avoidance of contagion and spillover uh, saw those expectations quickly dissipating. And despite some turbulence in AT1 markets, Euro area banks largely weathered the storm. So resilience was tested and once again, after the stresses caused by the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, I think we can say that it was proven. And since then, broadly speaking, market sentiment has gone through two phases. First, there was a period of excessive optimism about prospects for a soft landing of the global economy. And so that's the soft landing narrative is one whereby disinflation would proceed sufficiently rapidly that it would allow central banks to make an early so-called pivot, so that start to reduce interest rates and avoid recession. And this widespread optimism seemingly acted as a, as a kind of a counterbalance to the tightening of monetary policy. Now, we considered this market narrative to be overly optimistic, and we thought that it was setting markets up for disappointment. And then when US inflation started picking up again, and with the euro area inflation coming down a bit more slowly than we might have hoped, the narrative started to change and market conviction about a soft landing faded somewhat. And with that capitulation, the more adverse, higher for longer scenario gained traction. And it resulted in a rout in the bond market and the US stock market uh, briefly re-entered correction territory. Yes. Since then, the consensus has changed again. Uh, and it seems safe to say that uncertainty is high and it, it has been rising. And of course, cert uncertainties have also been compounded by the flare up of geopolitical tensions in the Middle East. OK, yeah, yeah. And uh, le indeed, let's look at the geopolitical situation. Uh, there are several conflicts going on and it's a human tragedy. My heart goes out to all the victims. Uh, from a financial stability perspective, what do the war in Ukraine and the conflict in the Middle East mean? Well, I think we've all seen how these geopolitical conflicts have entailed dreadful uh, humanitarian suffering, including the deaths of innocent people, the, dis the displacement of people from their homes, and of course, refugee crisis as well. Both events impacted energy markets adversely uh, as well, although this was much more so the case following the invasion of Ukraine because of the sanctions on Russia, supply disruptions, and shifts in energy trade patterns <clears throat> as many European countries work to reduce uh, their reliance on Russian gas. Now, whenever geopolitical tensions escalate in the Middle East, it's a relatively safe bet that oil prices will rise. Yeah. And that's because <clears throat> it's a major oil producing region and oil markets tend to be highly sensitive to events that could cause supply disruptions. Even perceptions can be enough. And so oil prices did actually rise briefly during the first couple of weeks after October the 7th when Israel was attacked. But with concerns easing about the likelihood that an oil producing country would become involved, uh, they've since fallen back. Now, you asked, what does it all mean for financial stability? Yeah. Well, so geopolitical risk can affect financial stability in several ways, <clears throat> through economic channels, through financial ones, and then simply by uh, creating uncertainty. 
So if energy markets are affected, the economy will be confronted with the so-called supply side shock. So that's where um, production capacity is affected negatively, causing prices to rise. And we saw that uh, with the surge of inflation after the invasion of Ukraine. Now, that required a response from monetary policy to bring inflation down. Now, with views, with market views somewhat torn uh, between a soft landing outcome and interest rates staying higher for longer, uh, any geopolitical tensions which could push inflation higher would make the higher for longer scenario more likely. And at the same time, then, the uncertainty part, investors often react to uncertainty by moving their assets to safer havens. Uh, that can lead to capital flight from, from, from riskier investments, for instance. And in the FSR, we show a lot of evidence that market pricing is underestimating the risks that lie ahead. So if shifts like that were to occur in response to a geopolitical event, it could destabilize uh, financial asset prices. I see. Yeah. Let's talk about banks now. And uh, because here in Europe, they've been quite strong lately. Uh, high interest rates have pushed their profits to a multi-year high. However, as you point out in the Financial Stability Review, their valuations have not responded to the improvement in bank fundamentals and profitability. Why? What's the actual health condition of euro area banks? So, I mean, if we look back to late 2008, so that, 2019, sorry, just before the pandemic, uh, low bank profitability in the euro area was high on our on our list of sources of financial stability concern. But this year, profitability has been going uh, from strength to strength. Uh, the reasons are, I think, relatively well known. Average funding costs have risen much more slowly uh, than the returns uh, that banks have been able to earn on their assets. So that has boosted net interest income margins. Okay. Uh, and then with margins increasing uh, more in countries where loans are contracted mostly on floating terms, and where so-called deposit betas, uh, betas have been low. Um, Can you repeat that? Deposit? Deposit betas. Uh, betas. So as an okay. aside, I sometimes think it might be easier to understand them if these betas were called retas. Uh, oh, so okay. <laughs> the realized interest uh, transmission effect or how much of the official rate change is passed through uh, to deposit rates. Uh, but as you said, we do have something of a conundrum. When we look at bank share price developments compared to bank profitability developments, Profitability has, on average, doubled uh, from the pre-pandemic levels uh, that was giving rise to those financial stability con concerns. But price book ratio, so that's one of the most common metrics of valuation for banks, have hardly changed. Uh, and price earnings ratios even fell. So what's going on? Uh, well, for one, the cost of equity has risen, and it's risen by about as much um, as the return on equity uh, has now, that's partly due, of course, to the fact that interest rates are higher, uh, risk-free rates are higher. And that raises required returns across the board, regardless of what kind of business um, you're talking about. The, but the conundrum is, why has improved profitability? So that's a source of organic growth in bank capital. Banks can grow their capital if they are profitable. Yes. And that should make them le less risky. But it hasn't actually lowered their so-called equity risk premium. Now, we offer some answers to this conundrum in box five of the FSR, uh, the main one being that neither bank analysts nor investors expect that this year's bumper profits uh, are going to last, and they're projecting lower profits next year. So revenues are set to decline because loan demand is expected to, uh, to remain weak and the cost of credit risk. So that's the cost of loan impairment. So if borrowers default on their loans, um, those costs are rising. And then added to that, now this really depends on how the economy performs in the future, but we're expecting uh, funding costs to rise over time uh, as competition among banks for deposits becomes more intense, causing that RITA <laughs> to rise. Now, all of this is to say that investors are, are not convinced that euro area banks offer so-called value opportunities. So their valuation ratios are low. That might seemingly make them attractive. Um, to, to for, for investors, but it, it, it can't really be excluded that low bank profitability is going to make a comeback as a financial stability concern going forward. Now, the reason for that is the legacy of low for long. We had this period of very low interest rates for a long time, and 
As a result of it, many banks have been left holding low yielding assets with long maturities. So think about mortgages that are, you know, 20 or more years in, 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 in maturity and um, have very low interest rates. Now, we also show on box five that so-called windfall taxes uh, can raise uh, the return that investors require for holding bank equity. Yeah. So in addition to reducing the resilience of the banks at a time when they are likely to be facing um, increasing challenges, taxes like that make it actually more expensive for banks to raise equity in the market. And that's not positive for financial stability. I see. I see. Interesting. Uh, It clarifies now. And um, another point is uh, in the report is the description of real estate markets as a source of concern for financial stability at this moment. High interest rates are squeezing borrowers. If somebody wants to buy a house today, they may think twice or think of people who took variable rate mortgages or, again, households which have to renegotiate their terms now. So for individuals, this is very tough. But what does it mean for banks and ultimately for financial stability? Yeah. So um, the impact of rising interest rates on borrowers indeed does um as you said, Stefania, depend very much on whether the financing is contracted at variable rates or if the term of the loan is short and whether it must be refinanced with with a new loan. So borrowers uh, with contracts like these, uh, they feel the pinch of higher interest, higher mortgage payments sooner uh, than those who have taken out loans at fixed rates for longer terms. So in the euro area, mortgage lending terms um, across, when we look across countries are rather heterogeneous. Um, around two fifths of mortgages have rates uh, that are fixed for more than 10 years. And more than half uh, have fixation periods of five years or longer. So for those that have some years to go uh, before the fixation period comes to an end, they actually won't have noticed any change in their payments yet. But those on, on variable rates are, are, are at the end of their fixation period, the ones that you were speaking of, they will be in a, in, in a worse position, exactly. of course. Yeah. Now, for financial stability, an important feature of lending practices in Europe is that non-recourse mortgages. Um, so let me, th- those are mortgages where the lender's only recourse in case of a default is to repossess uh, the mortgage property and then has no further claim against the borrower. Those kinds of mortgages are not very common. I mean, we, we saw problems with, with, with those kinds of mortgages in the US in 2008. This means that households who have seen the values of their house fall, they can't simply hand the keys back to the bank without expecting consequences. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if they're facing challenges in making uh, higher mortgage payments, uh, they're more likely to run down their savings uh, or to cut back on consumption um, say luxuries, uh, before defaulting on their mortgages. Uh, Now, budget arithmetic for a household will change, of course, when faced with unemployment. Yes. Now, that is when we would expect to see defaults rising uh, and where we might see some financial stability problems. Now, we don't see any concrete signs of of, of the labour market turning yet, but we have seen we have been seeing uh, unemployment slowly rising in some countries. And of course, a sharper rise uh, would obviously be a downside risk. So what about commercial properties, John? Now, indeed, we have a bit more concern here uh, in the, about the commercial real estate market. And, and here one could say that this time really is different. Um, and it really is different because the normal cyclical downturn uh, is being amplified by structural challenges affecting, in particular, Uh, the retail and the office segments of of the commercial property market. Um, So a report published by the EU Commission earlier this year shows that the the proportion of e-shoppers in Europe grew from 55% in 2012 to 75% in 2022. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was no doubt spurred by the pandemic. Uh, people doing more of their, 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 their retail shopping online. And that has taken away uh, that has taken business away uh, from the high street shops, yeah. and of course, and has an impact on their, on their values. Uh, also, working from home, uh, now, on the positive side, it minimized disruption in many service uh, sectors during the pandemic. Uh, but now we have a legacy of, of, of that the remote, remote working has been retained. Uh, higher vacancy, that means that you get, get higher vacancy rates in, in office buildings which reduces the value of those buildings. And then with higher interest rates, uh, we're seeing leveraged uh, property company owners facing challenges 
in refinancing their existing debt. Now, ultimately, um, this can lead to an increase of loan defaults and foreclosures. And we've seen we've been seeing a bit of this um, already. And it puts downward pressure on the prices then that sellers can get for those properties. Yeah. Now, the question is, does this pose a systemic risk? And we try in a special feature on the FSR uh, to answer that question. And the answer is, well, that a commercial property crisis would not be enough on its own uh, to cause widespread capital depletion and capital depletion in the banking system. The reason for that is that bank exposures, while they are material, they're simply not large enough. Um, to cause <clears throat> widespread uh, problems. But a decline in real estate markets, of course, can spill over to other sectors. So, for example, construction companies, yes. real estate agencies and other businesses uh, can suffer. And that could lead to job losses and reduced economic activity. Um, and then additionally, a decline in commercial property uh, values. Don't forget there are investors in those properties. There's an impact on the rental incomes for investors and that affects their financial health and their ability to invest uh, in other areas. So it is not the commercial property market is not an island, so to speak. Yes. They are not isolated indeed. And on balance, I mean, what you just described is a situation that ro- looks rather gloomy. Do you see any reasons for optimism? So. The financial cycle has unmistakably turned um, and the severity of the contraction we think is going to depend on whether we get a whether we get a soft landing or a harder one. Now, a particular challenge that we are confronted with at this juncture is that we have several vulnerabilities uh, unraveling simultaneously. Mm. So housing and commercial real estate and, and others. Now, that may seem gloomy. Um, But I always say a financial stability assessment is not complete without an evaluation of resilience. And here we can derive, I think, a measure of reassurance. Um, It was not always the case that the yin balanced the yang (laughs) uh, uh, before, certainly not before the, the, the global financial crisis. But our view is that the deliberate efforts taken since then to fortify capital and liquidity buffers within the banking system have positioned it well uh, to face these higher risks. So the EBA carried out um, a stress test of European banks this summer. And despite a scenario that had severe negative shocks, including a global recession, higher unemployment uh, and and increased interest rates and credit spread, so everything going wrong simultaneously, European banks remained resilient uh, in that stress test. And the reason for this Uh, The reason for this positive outcome was that the average fully loaded common equity tier one capital ratio, so that's the important ratio (laughs) uh, for regulators, uh, at the start of the exercise, that was 15 percent. Uh, and it allowed banks to withstand capital depletion, depletion and still meet regulatory requirements at the end uh, of the exercise. Now, that's not to say that there's any room for complacency. Uh, that's why we're advocating uh, in this issue of the FSR for targeted macroprudential policy intervention for, for, where needed. So in real estate markets, for example, with the aim of safeguarding the enduring strength of this resilience through uh, the challenging times uh, that we think lie ahead. So gloomy picture, um, the safeguards in place are stronger than before, but it's not time for complacency. This exactly. is in a nutshell, exactly. the message. Yes. Thanks, John. So it's good to end on a more positive note. Before we wrap up, we always have a question for our guests, and that's for a hot tip on today's topic. So real estate markets and financial stability. John, what's your hot tip today? So, um, actually, as we we started with geopolitical risks issues, and it has been a recurring theme of these uh, podcasts on financial stability since we started them, I thought I would actually make a recommendation uh, for what I view as a valuable and independent source for gaining a deeper understanding of geopolitics. Uh, And that is the YouTube channel of Johnny Harris. Uh, an award, an, an Emmy Award winning journalist and filmmaker, uh, Harris has an exceptional talent, I think, uh, for breaking down complex global uh, geopolitical issues into digestible and engaging content. Uh, he has a unique storytelling style, uh, which he combines with really stunning visual visuals, often based on maps. It's clearly involving in-depth research and his explanations of current or historical events are really 
I think, easy to understand and concise. And I think it's no wonder that his his videos routinely reach millions within days of being uploaded. Wow. Yeah. So Johnny Harris style. Johnny Harris. Very good. Thank you, John. Sounds very interesting. And this brings us to the end of this episode. Uh, I want to thank John Felt, Deputy Director General for Macroprudential Policy and Financial Stability at the ECB. Thank you, John. Thank you, Stefania. Dear listeners, check out uh, the show notes for more on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Stefania Secola. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. In the spirit of Europe, today I'd like to end in French and say à bientôt. Until next time, thanks for listening.